Dr. Darian Pollard is the new Montgomery College president. She's been busy meeting with the college community and is starting to tackle the issues that matter most. She joins us next to discuss what she thinks the future holds for Montgomery College and how she'll strive to make MC the most relevant community college in the country. A special edition of Campus Conversations is next. I'm Elizabeth Homan. And I'm Marcus Rosanna. And this is Campus Conversations, the show that brings you in touch with your community and your community's college, Montgomery College. With us today is the president of Montgomery College, Dr. Darian Pollard. Hello. Hello. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm excited to be here. Dr. Pollard, you've been on the job for about three months now. Tell us, what have you been up to? <laughs> Well, I guess I shouldn't say twiddling my thumbs. <laughs> I have been uh, wonderfully busy. I've been spending lots of time learning both our internal and external community. So I spent quite a bit of time uh, visiting our local uh, legislators, local leaders within the community, while at the same time spending an equal amount of time trying to understand the dynamics and needs of our students, our faculty, our staff, and our administrative team. So it has been a glorious first, what, two months now, and I'm really excited about the future. So let's go back three months yeah. or a little bit longer than that. Sure. Um, when you first heard about the position for president of Montgomery College, Certainly. what attracted you? Well, to be honest, when I first saw the job description, I said, oh, it would be nice to work at Montgomery College sometime in the future. That was really what I thought. I thought, because when you think about Montgomery College, it has a mystique, it has a presence, it has a reputation. This certainly let me think that I really want to work there, but I don't know if right now I can do that. Um, however, I think the universe has a way of bringing you where you're supposed to be. So I spent some time obviously researching the institution, talking with my friends and colleagues in the field, and then I said, you know what, I want to be a part of a college that believes in its greatness, that believes that it can make a difference in the community, and really believes that we're each positioned to do something significant for our community. So I just said, you know what, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring, and lo and behold, here we are. So I, I, I feel, again, just blessed to be here. Well, it's quite a difference. California, you were previous president of Los Pasitos College sure. in California, sure. and now Montgomery County, Maryland. What are you seeing in differences of the two community colleges as well as the two communities and how they work with their community college? Well, certainly now I'm bi-coastal, so I've worked in both places. But I will say that what was very interesting, even before going to California, I was in Illinois for about 12 years, and I started my career at the College of Lake County, which is a phenomenal two-year institution in the suburbs of Chicago. What's interesting to me is that Lake County, Illinois, is not very different from Montgomery County, Maryland. So I spend quite a bit of time drawing on that experience experience as well. The tax base is very similar, the educational systems are similar, and the local politics are very similar as well. The adjacency to Chicago almost has the same adjacency to D.C., so that was good. But I would tell you that my role at Las Positas, I think, prepared me significantly as well for this job by doing two things. One, it reinforced for me the need to be an advocate for the college wherever I am. So when I was in the community, I'd be at the grocery store, a student would say, hey, are you our president? I'm like, yeah, I'm your president with my baseball cap on. So I had to be prepared for that. But I think the other thing is that I also had to be willing to tell the story of the college and the community. So I would be uh, having uh, lunch with a local legislator and had to talk very passionately about what we were doing at the college at that time. So it prepared me for that. The other thing, I mean, to be quite frank, is the budget issue. You know, California has been significantly impacted by budget issues and really develop a strategy for that I think I cut my teeth in California so when I when I talk to people here are we going to have some significant issues we have to deal with no doubt about it but I also have to tell you that I feel prepared to lead the organization through that challenge what are what are some of the things that you learned about the college community in say your first week or two weeks mm. on the job any surprises you know okay surprises one is that I have to learn to navigate the campuses a little bit more. That's always been an interesting part, you know, reading the maps, and I'm unaccustomed <laughs> to not knowing where I am. So that's been very disconcerting. We're still, we're still you still working that way? And I'll say, how do I get here? I'm like, okay, I can do that. I um, mean, everything takes longer than I thought. So I thought it was going to be a 20-minute ride over here. It never is a 20-minute ride. So that takes longer. Um, I'd have to say, though, that 
the college is wonderfully passionate about the work we do. I hear faculty and staff Over. talk to me about our students. That something is significant. I also see an organization that craves leadership. They're really looking for someone who's going to really articulate a vision for the future, develop a plan to do that, get everyone engaged in that process and to be, I, I like to use the word radically inclusive, that everyone is engaged in that and then moreover that we're going to see it through through the long haul. So that's something I think is significant. But in terms of surprises, I have to say uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a planner. Uh, I do a lot of research. So before I even uh, considered applying to Montgomery College, I studied this college inside and out to the extent that I could. And I feel that uh, there, aren't, there isn't too much that surprises me. Can I follow up with that? Yeah. You've done your research and there were some uh, transitional leadership issues uh, going on. Um, what were some of your concerns? Mm. Um, I know that you researched it and saw some of the positive things that are going on, but what were some of those concerns about coming to the college? Well, I think, and I appreciate the question because I think it, one is courageous for you to ask it, and I thank you for that because I think that a lot of us right now, there are colleges across this country that are dealing with these, these issues. I can't think of a college of this size that probably at some point in its history has not had to deal with leadership changes or significant uh, challenges at some level. For me, though, um, I think what was interesting to me is to come to an organization after there had been a transitionary president. So Dr. Pinckney, I think, very clearly had a very clear agenda about what he was going to do coming in and his job was to help prepare the college for a new person coming in. So for me, I, I'm much more interested in being a president and not really focusing on the presidency. I don't get caught up in the illusion of what a presidency is. So I think that that has uniquely positioned me for the work that I have to do. I also think that the college is in the midst of healing. And I like to think that I'm a very nurturing person, and I think that that's a part of my role, and I can accept that and enjoy that role. So I, I think that the college, and to be quite frank, is also to tell the college to get its swagger back on, okay? We've, we dealt with this issue. It's time to shake it off. You know what? We've done that. We've recognized we had an issue. The board, I think, took courageous steps to do the things that they had to do. The community is ready for us to move on. So it's a matter of our own consciousness. Shake it off. Let's move on. Thank you. You're welcome. When you're going out into the to the meetings and you're yeah. meeting with faculty, you're meeting with staff, your background as a faculty member, starting out as a professor, how do you mm. think that helps you pr either prepare for those meetings or or connect? Yeah. One, I think at the core of who I am, I am a teacher. And I think the beautiful part about that is that when we're talking about things that are happening in the classroom. I very clearly can relate it to my own experiences having been in the classroom. In fact, my first day I was touring, or one of my first days I was touring the Germantown campus, and we walked in, and I happened to see an English class, and the faculty members said, oh, come on in, come on in. So I walked in, and I said, what are you talking about? And this was a developmental English class, and they were talking about audience. And I said, oh, I said, you know, when I taught audience, like 15 minutes later, I had taken over this <laughs> lesson on art, but I remember that. I remember grading the papers. I remember what it's like to be worried about your students and figure out how to do interventions with them. But I've been a staff member. I've su provided support to administrators. I knew what it was like to need to be heard, to understand that your value is significant within the organization and have people validate that. So for me, uh, I, I believe that every experience I've had, and I think all of us, shapes us and prepares us for where we are. The key is that we have to recall that on a regular basis. So for me, I remember being a faculty member. I remember being an admin assistant someplace, and I remember very clearly what it was like to be a student on a college campus and I use those experiences on a daily basis. I was going to say being a student that's something I've heard you say quite a bit about college is where you really came into your own and that you really found what you were passionate about and what you wanted to do. Tell us a little bit about your college you, you experience. Did you, did you have the goal to be the president of a college? Obviously, <laughs> you, you became an English professor. What were your goals, exactly. like Beth was talking about, in well, college? I, it's funny. Some of you have heard me talk. I've had several goals. First, I thought that I was going to be a hairdresser, hence all the new hairdos I had done. <laughs> uh, I thought that I was going to be uh, a missionary, because I grew up in the strong black Baptist church. I thought that I was going to go out and be a minister. Uh, and then I decided I went to college thinking that I was going to be an attorney. So I had all these kind of different leanings. At some point, I always wanted to be a librarian because I love books. Uh, I heard yeah. nanny too. Yeah, well that was that was when I decided I was going to drop out of college. You know, I, I was actually uh, in college for about a year and a half. I had been doing some nannying or babysitting for someone and I was lost. I was a very typical college student. I kind of 
come to college for the wrong reasons. I was too busy, as I often say, I was too busy being in college and not being a student in college. There's a very, I was a very social butterfly. I had a good time <laughs> in college. Uh, but as a result of that, I was lost, and I was going through, I think, an identity crisis. So I thought, I'm going to drop out of school. I'm going to go become a nanny in New York and work for this rich family. I, this is my whole plan. Signed up, read all this, signed the papers, and prepared to do that. And I had this wonderful woman who I was actually babysitting for said to me, Darian, you are more than that. And I kind of paused, and she said, that's no slight to, if you really want to be a nanny, be the best nanny she could be. She said, but you are more than that, and you're scared to reach out and grab your blessing. And I was like, oh, my Lord. So that was, it was a powerful moment for me, and I think college in a lot of ways represents what those years are. You're supposed to be exploring things. You're supposed to be challenging yourself. You're supposed to be growing and stretching. And for me, it is no mistake that I am working in a college because I know exactly how I found myself there. And even my own professional career has been a constant unveiling in a college environment. So I, I probably will die in my office someplace at a college because I love what I do. I love what we represent. We have about a minute left before we go to a break, yes. but um, tell us who is Darian? Mm. Darian is a passionate person. She's a Scorpio, and she is uh, very much a Scorpio, those of you who believe in astrology. Um, I, am, I love to laugh. Uh, I enjoy having fun. I believe in hard work, but I also believe in playing hard. Uh, Darian believes that each of us has the ability to change the world. I believe we're made better by the stories that become a part of who we are. And I think I believe deeply in what we do in community colleges. I cannot imagine doing another job in my life right now. That's a little bit about who Darian is. <laughs> she also hates shoes and loves pajamas. <laughs> and good tequila. That's a whole other subject. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break. But when we come back, we're going to talk more with Dr. Pollard. Stay with us. You're watching Campus Conversations. I have found that the greatest gift that I've had in my life is either someone just saying something to me at the right moment or opening a book or turning on the television, and someone had something to say that make a difference in my life, not to preach, but to, to write in such a way that it could open someone up to something. So I'm hoping that writing, my writing, may make a difference in someone else's life. I hope so. Montgomery College, Endless Possibilities, 240-567-5000. The reality is that there are very strong career opportunities in networking and technology. It doesn't matter if you're a woman, if you're a man, what culture you're from, it's, it's more the value that you bring to the table. What I know for sure in the core of who I am about community colleges and Montgomery College is that we can change the trajectory of an individual, we can transform the quality of life for a family, and we can enhance the intellectual, cultural, and economic essence of a community. Welcome back to Campus Conversations. We've been talking today with the president of Montgomery College, Dr. Darian Pollard. Again, Dr. Pollard, thank you for being here. Happy to be here. Got a question for you about your priorities as the president mm. of Montgomery College. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a little bit of an outline of your priorities? Sure. I actually, I have several, and I think part of what I have to do is to ensure that I scale those down some and make sure that they are indeed achievable. But I think one is to certainly make sure the college uh, has moved forward and is moving on a healing track and that's something you clearly hear me articulate I even think I did in the first segment of this of our dialogue today. Uh, secondly, I am very much committed to ensuring uh, that we become a part of the completion agenda that President Obama has set forth. Uh, where well, he has identified that by 2020 he would like to see a 50% increase in the number of Americans who have a degree or certificate that leads to employment. That to me is very significant for Montgomery College as a national uh, institution that's recognized at the national level to be actively engaged in that process. 
Um, the other thing I have interest in, though, is this real issue of innovation. I remain convinced that if we're really going to address the completion agenda, if we're going to look at solutions to the budget crises, if we're going to look at student achievement, we're really going to have to have a serious conversation about how we function as an organization and very clearly develop some innovative techniques to respond to that. For instance, I am struck by Fortune 500 companies. I am an avid reader, and uh, every month I get Harvard Business Review. Now, a lot of my friends laugh. You know, I'm an English teacher. I get Harvard <laughs> Business Review. But I love reading it because it has these nuggets in here. And I'm always struck by these companies who we think of the most innovative in the country that, one, have a very clear brand and understand what they do, how they do it, what their mission is. But secondly, they have a clearly defined research and development portion of their organization where they invest as much resources as possible into new program, new service, new product delivery. I remain convinced that the best ideas that we have about who we are and who we can become as a college can come from our faculty and staff if we are to take resources and invest for them to be able to come up with ideas and put them into an incubator, grow them, create an R&D function for the college, and then replicate that on a much larger basis. So I have interest in figuring out how to do that. Uh, clearly, navigating the budget scenarios that we have coming up is a big priority for me. I also have several senior level staff members that I have to fill. Um, that's a wonderful opportunity, though, to craft a team that's going to approach us in the future. And then last but not least is really to make sure there's a college that we remain true to who we are, that we embrace who we are, that we put student in every dialogue that we have on campus, and that we have fun. You know, I, I like to have fun, and I think that's a part of what we should be doing as a college. After all, this is a college. That's doggone it, it sure is. <laughs> going back to innovation, yeah. um, where, how, do you, how are you going to further and encourage faculty and staff to be innovative mm. in their thoughts and their ideas? Because some people might say, oh, inherently, colleges are all about innovation, aren't the ideas already coming forward. I would think you would see that an institution that actually produces scholarship, you would probably see that innovation is there. I think, unfortunately, what has happened at the two-year level, we've almost acquiesced our right to be intellectuals to our four-year colleagues. And we said, you all go and produce the scholarship, you all go out there and to figure out what it's going to look for application, and then give it to us. I know Montgomery College faculty don't embrace that. I've already seen our faculty be innovative in that regard, but I want to scale it up on a different level. If we know that a significant number of our students are coming in underprepared in reading, writing, and math, the same ways in which we've done it will not last. And I'm seeing that our math faculty have already developed a, pro a pilot program on this very issue about how to provide instruction in a very different play way. I would argue that every student who comes to our college should have an indivi individualized learning plan. That from the day they come here, that we talk about what their goals are and that we develop a strategy for, for them to get there. That to me is significant. I think that's innovative because it's going to require resources and talent to be able to do that. But moreover, really to sit down with the student and have an in-depth conversation, that's significant. Um, I think the other thing about innovation is that we have to give people a reason to dream and give them an opportunity to test it. You know, my best example of this, when I was at the College of Lake County, we had a scenario where clocks were always off. I mean, the time was forever wrong. And it was really causing a significant issue. You'd show up for a meeting, you could be 10 minutes late or 15 minutes early. I and mean, it always is the case. And then, of course, the students had the 10-minute rule. <laughs> so class wasn't there, teacher's not there, we're gone. And I think what we, we had a staff member who said, I actually think it was a math faculty member, I think I shared this already, said, why don't we come up with this idea of the atomic clock and figure out how to use those within the classroom to help get the, it was a simple idea that none of us had even thought about who were in the administration. We simply, though, allowed this faculty member who knew this idea to bring it forward. There's lots of that across an organization. So how do we create spaces and places for that dialogue? That, to me, is what innovation is about. But I think some people might say that Innovation, though, requires resources. How are you going to do that in a difficult budget year? Well, I think we can do a couple of things. One is that we need to go out and privately raise for it, which I think is a significant issue. I think the other thing that we have to do is that we have to look at how we allocate the current resources we have. I think that that's a very significant issue. And then last but not least, I think that we can look at trying to cut back in other areas. But the premise of your statement I would disagree with. I don't think that we have to have new resources to be innovative. All of us can walk around and figure out little ways in which we can be more efficient and be able to deliver a better product simply by the way we do our work. We see it all the time, but we get caught up in, this is how we've been doing it. This is how such and such did it before me. And the idea of simply saying, you know what, just pause. 
Now, let's assess how this works and map it out. And to be quite frank, we might come up with a process improvement that might actually save money without using resources. And if we get caught up in the idea that everything is going to cost new money, then we would not grow as a college. Because I'm here to tell you all, ain't no new money coming. Okay, So we've got to be very clear about using the resources we have. Let's switch gears a little bit and let's focus on the students. Um, this is an evolving uh, landscape when we're talking economy in this world that we live in today. There are students coming to community colleges that haven't been to college in 30 years. Sure. There are students coming to community colleges right out of high school mm -hmm. because they can't afford a four-year school and they're coming to the community college for affordability and accessibility, if sure. you want to look at it that way. Talk about the groups of students that a community college can be advantageous to, whether it be the 18-year-old or the 45-year-old who has been stung by the economy. You've answered your own question, Marcus. I mean, that, that really is the beauty of a community college, and that's why I choose to work at one. We could be serving the working reservist and the returning veteran. We could be serving the immigrant daughter and the native son. We could be serving the uh, freshly graduated college student and the recently laid off uh, manufacturer. We could be serving the high school student who's still uh, pursuing education and the senior citizen who says, oh, I want to take personal enrichment classes. We could be serving someone who has a bachelor's degree from another country and they're wanting now to move into a different career choice by coming to this country. I mean, we have the gamut. That's our mission. I mean, the, if we look, our mission, unlike I think a lot of other institutions, has both breadth and depth. It has meaning, it has significance, it has weight. So for me, the idea that when I hear people say, oh, should you change your mission as a community college? I, I don't buy that because I know the lives that we change. I know the significance of that in a family. Do we have to think about how we serve that mission? I agree. Do we think about new partners that we could take on to help actualize that? I think the worst thing we can do, though, is to buy into a level of academic elitism that says we can't serve different groups of students. I, I, I had the privilege of going out and visiting our faculty and staff out at the Wheaton, Co Wheaton campus, and I shouldn't say campus, but building where we have our many of our students who are GED, ESL, and many of us who we might categorize as the least of these. And the reality is that I know that we can change their lives. We can do things that are significant for them and their families and their community. So this idea of the public good of education is very significant to me. But that's the beauty of a community college. We don't have a traditional student. And I reject the idea that we ever should have one. Right. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Now, what about looking five years down the round, yeah. road? You've been president for five years. You're looking back. How do you think you will have changed, the college will have changed? What will five years down the road look like? Well, I'm hoping I won't be like President Obama. My hair keeps getting grayer and grayer because <laughs> I've made a commitment to some of my girlfriends. We're not going to start dyeing our hair, so we're going to see how that plays out. But I, I think that one is that I will, I think, have a, a much... Um, when I, I hit my minor was religious studies when I was in college and was trying to work out a few things. <laughs> but one of the things we talked about is this idea of how words have meaning and, um, and to know someone. You know, you th in the biblical sense, to know someone means you know them on an intimate basis. I'd like to be able to say that I know this college and this community on an intimate basis because I understand what we're doing and how we do what we do. I think the college would be better prepared financially. I think that we'll have a fiscal plan. Will it be a plan that's going to say we're going to continue to do things the way we have been doing? No, but I think we'll have a plan that people will feel that they're a part of. As a matter of fact, we'll have a new strategic plan for the college that positions us for the future. That's going to ask very sincere questions about how we execute the type of work we want to do. Um, I would also say that we have repositioned students as the center of everything that we do. And I'm not saying that we've completely put them to the side, but I think in the moment of these challenges we have now, it's a lot easier to talk about how this is affecting us versus how it's affecting our students. Yeah, me. So I, I'd like to spend some time making sure that, you know, we reverse the dialogue and make sure that we're talking about students. I think the other thing for me in five years, I want to say that we've made um, progress as an organization in meeting this completion agenda, that we have recognized that we are positioned uniquely for the future, and that we're being recognized for that, both by our county, by our state, and our national bodies. That, to me, would be saying that we've done something good. And that my son is successfully in third grade by that point. So <laughs> that would be hey, good. that's the most important that's goal. exactly <laughs> it. At the end of the day, it really is. Well, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, some final thoughts. I'm in my third year, 
with uh, Montgomery College uh, in an active program, Air Conditioning Contractors of America, with the opportunities that's been provided me. I'm going to school. I'm going working with a very good company. They want you to uh, be highly trained, and Montgomery College provides that. To get a degree is very, very important. The piece of paper that you get with that, you can take with you anywhere, and no one can take it away once you get it. Montgomery College, Endless Possibilities, 240-567-5000. National Junior College Athletic Association. Opportunity for excellence. Fast track to your dream. As such, my vision for Montgomery College is a simple one. Montgomery College will be the most relevant community college in the country by meeting the needs of our students and proving essential to the success of our community. We have just a few minutes left and I want to ask you just a final few questions. Sure. I've heard you say quite a bit about how you want to make Montgomery College the most relevant community college in the nation. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you mean? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've heard a lot of institutions articulate the fact that they want to be the best community college. They want to be the most this or the most that. My perspective is that the best community college is the one that's most relevant to its community by meeting its community's needs and helping the students be the best students that they could be and meet their goals. So for me, relevancy has more weight. It has more significance. It's just being good at something. And, and for me, I think we, we're at a crucial point historically. Uh, we have a decision. We can either choose to be the type of organization that continues to do what we're doing, and we'll be good. We'll be fine, we'll keep going, we'll keep serving students, we'll keep doing things with our community. Or we can choose at some moment in our life to say, I want to be something more than that. Uh, for me, I've never suffered from a poverty of ambition. I think it's important to ensure that we're really seeking to do something much bigger than who we are. Part of that has a lot to do with my own belief system. And I often believe that if you can do something more, you aspire to something more than who you are, the significance of that can be overwhelming within a community. So that to me is important to make sure that we are relevant to our students and to our community. We have about a minute left yeah. and can you tell us uh, what you have, what would you have accomplished to consider yourself being a successful president mm -hmm. at Montgomery College? I think that I've articulated a clear vision for the future, that there's broad-based buy-in for that, that I've identified clearly um, understood metrics about how you would assess that. Uh, I would say that the college it is in a better position than it has been and that there's a cohesive sense about our future, uh, that we have an appropriate sense of urgency about the future. And I think, but last but not least, that people feel good about coming to work at the college mm -hmm. and our students feel good coming to be our students here. If we've done that, and the beautiful part about that, that doesn't have as much to do about me, it's about how I position other people within the organization. And that's how I view my presidency. If I create the environment, get out of the way and other people will shine and that's how I do my job. I want to end on a fun note. Yeah. Um, what many people may or may not know is that you have a little one at home. Oh yeah. Miles, yes. your little your son. When you go home at night, what do you tell him what mom does? Mm. Well, first of all, <laughs> when I, if I can get in the door, because he meets me at the door every day, um, he'll say, what did you, he'll, he'll say, Mama, how was your day? And I'll say, my day was good. How was yours? He said, my day was great. And he commences to tell me about Luke and Ian at school. And that to me is about what's the most important part of the day. He lets me know that all of this is secondary to what actually happens at home. So you hopefully will see me be able to balance those things. Well, thanks so much for joining us. But it's really thank been you. a pleasure. I thank you, Dr. Pollock. Thank you. And thank you for watching Campus Conversations, the show that brings you in touch with your community and your community's college, Montgomery College. I'm Elizabeth Homan. And I'm Marcus Rosano. We'll see you next time. <laughs>